Welcome to the Fort Harrison Visitor Center. This quaint log cabin was built in the 1930s by a group of local businessmen and historians. They called themselves the Richmond Battlefield Parks Corporation. For the first time, the battlefields around Richmond were being preserved, and much of that early preservation effort focused on the Fort Harrison area. A camp of the Civilian Conservation Corps, or CCC, was set up here to clear the trees, put in roads, and make the park sites accessible to the public. Their work continued for about a decade. On the 70th anniversary of the Battle of Fort Harrison, nearly 1,000 people came to commemorate the battle. Dignitaries present included the Governor of Virginia, the Director of the National Park Service, distinguished historian Douglas Southall Freeman, and even veterans of the battle. Yet to most people, Fort Harrison remains an obscure battle. Why was so much effort and money expended during the Great Depression to preserve this site? What did the people of that time remember that we have forgotten? To answer that question, we must go back to the fall of 1864. It was the fourth autumn of the war, and it was also an election year. The spring campaigns had produced high casualties, and the Union armies were stalemated at Petersburg and Atlanta. Many people in the North wondered if the war could ever be won. Democrats responded to this sentiment and ran a campaign for peace and nominated General George B. McClellan as their candidate. McClellan had commanded the Eastern Army in 1862 and remained a popular figure. Abraham Lincoln worried that if victories did not come soon, he would lose the election and possibly the war. Then, on September 2nd, three days after McClellan was nominated, Union forces under General William Tecumseh Sherman captured Atlanta. Suddenly it seemed that progress was being made. The war might, just might, be coming to a conclusion. In Virginia, General Ulysses S. Grant sensed an opportunity. He knew that Robert E. Lee's Confederate Army was stretched very thin around Petersburg and Richmond. If he could send a force north of the James River in a surprise attack, the Confederate defenses around Richmond might be penetrated. The Confederate capital could be captured in a single day. The task fell to General Benjamin Butler. Butler was a Massachusetts politician and commanded the Army of the James, which had spent most of the spring and summer bottled up in the Bermuda Hundred Peninsula. Butler wanted desperately to break out of his own stalemate. Now he was given the task not only of striking a blow at the Confederates, but capturing Richmond. Butler would cross the James River with 27,000 men. It would be a two-pronged assault. To the east, General David Burney's Tenth Corps would attack the Confederate defenses at Newmarket Heights. If successful, they would turn west and drive toward Richmond. This strike force would be heavily comprised of African-American soldiers or United States colored troops. Butler was a great advocate of black soldiers and hoped that their success would lead to greater equality after the war. To the west, General Ord's 18th Corps would attack Fort Harrison, located on Widow Chafin's farm, driving a hole in the Richmond defenses. When the two wings had achieved their goal, they would unite and press up the road to Richmond. At the same time, Grant would strike Lee's right flank west of Petersburg, threatening Lee's railroad lifeline. If everything had worked according to plan, Richmond would fall, and Lee's army would be trapped at Petersburg. On the morning of September 29, 1864, the stagnant Virginia front exploded to life. At Newmarket Heights, Bernie's colored troops encountered stiff resistance. After several long hours of fighting, they captured the heights and drove westward. For their bravery in the fight that day, 14 African-American soldiers would later receive the Medal of Honor. Southeast of Fort Harrison, Ord's 18th Corps began its attack. 300 Confederates in the fort raked the attacking columns with cannon and musketry fire, inflicting severe casualties. Ord's men were able to find cover in a slight depression in front of the fort. Eventually, they surged over the parapet and put the Confederates to flight. The attackers then fanned out south and north towards Forts Hoke and Johnson, but Confederate defenders held their ground. In the attack toward Fort Hoke, General Ord was wounded. 
Due to confusion and high casualties, the 18th Corps' attack stalled out and Union soldiers dug earthworks to enclose Fort Harrison. To the north of here, the 10th Corps continued its advance, but suffered severe casualties in attacks on Fort Gilmer. No further progress could be made. But the cost had been high. The day's fighting resulted in 500 Confederate and 3,000 Union casualties. In addition, General Hiram Burnham was killed leading his brigade into Fort Harrison. The fort was later renamed in his honor. In Richmond, panic reigned. Businesses closed and all able-bodied men were called to the defense of the Confederate capital. Never before had Richmond come so close to being captured. The next day, Robert E. Lee arrived on the north side of the James River with soldiers from the Petersburg Front. He was determined to retake Fort Harrison. But the Confederate counterattack was disorganized and Union troops stood their ground. The Confederate attack failed. Fort Harrison now belonged to the Union troops. The Confederates congratulated themselves for saving Richmond. Throughout the North, the capture of Fort Harrison was front page news. Finally, Union soldiers had a toehold in the Richmond defenses. It seemed only a matter of time before Richmond fell. Republicans pointed to Fort Harrison as even more proof that the war was finally being won. Lincoln's reelection now looked even more assured. Grant, however, was not interested in continuing the assaults here. A quiet settled over the battlefield. Confederates built a new fort opposite Fort Burnham, called Fort Beauregard, and continued as before. Due to the strong Union presence here, Lee was forced to keep large numbers of troops in front of Richmond, further weakening his Petersburg lines. The stage was set for the final collapse of Lee's army. Grant waited only for the election and the coming spring. At Fort Burnham, the quiet front was a welcome relief for the soldiers. They built winter quarters and strengthened their lines. Confederates did the same thing. Photographers who visited Fort Burnham even managed to capture rare images of Confederate soldiers standing on their distant fort, while Union pickets kept watch in the field. For six months, Union and Confederate soldiers faced each other here. Finally, in April 1865, with the Confederates evacuating Petersburg, Union soldiers here readied themselves for another advance, this time to capture Richmond. They heard the Confederates destroying their ironclads at Drury's Bluff. They saw the sky glowing red. Richmond was burning. The next day, Federal troops cautiously advanced across the plain between the lines, but the Confederates were gone. The men who had held the lines here at Fort Harrison became the first Union soldiers to enter Richmond. Lee's surrender was a week away. <laughs>